The Free Library of Philadelphia is proud to present a podcast from our author event series, recorded live at the Central Library on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. To learn more about the Free Library, the Central Library Expansion Project, and how your contribution can help our programs and services for the community, please visit freelibrary.org. My name is Gary Kramer. I'm a freelance writer for the Philadelphia Gay News, the Philadelphia City Paper, and some other publications. Our guest tonight is John Waters. He was born in Baltimore in 1946, grew a pencil mustache, wrote and directed some films, and has been an arbiter of taste, good and bad, ever since. (laughs) He's been called the Pope of Trash and the Prince of Puke. (laughs) Some see him as a threat to decency. To me, he is a role model. The first time I met John was here in this very library about 25 years ago. I did a roundtable interview, and I waited around for him to sign my copy of Crackpot. It was a book about his obsessions, and it shaped my outlook on life. You could say I became obsessed with it. Crackpot started me compiling lists, like Waters did, of 101 things I loved and hated. I developed an appreciation for the talents of Pia Zadora. So bad, and yet so good, in The Lonely Lady. And I didn't think anyone else felt exactly the same way I did about Woody Allen's interiors, with that tracking shot that rips right through you. If you've seen the film, you know the one. Waters articulated what I thought. He served as my example, and I emulated his behavior. Well, some of it. It's hard to believe 25 years ago, I was more familiar with his work as a writer than as a filmmaker. But I was. His writing ripped through me like that tracking shot. Achingly funny, incisive, and it provided a perspective I identified with. At that time, I had only seen John Waters' notorious 1972 film, Pink Flamingos. Someone showed it at my college dorm. I went in expecting to watch five minutes of it, and I stayed through the whole thing. Fascinated, repelled, unable to tear my eyes from the screen. I distinctly remember that when it ended, I went downstairs into the men's room and threw up. (laughs) Such was the indelible impression his work made on me. But I know from reading Waters that this is perhaps the highest compliment you could give him. If someone vomits watching one of my films, he says, it's like getting a standing ovation. (laughs) While I've seen every film he's made since Hairspray, which came out theatrically shortly after that notorious Pink Flamingo screening, I've been waiting patiently, anxiously, for his next book. Finally, he has published Role Models, and like Crackpot, I read it and then reread it at once. Now I'm thinking of compiling chapters on all the books and artwork and people who've influenced me. I would start with our guest tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, John Waters. Thank you. I have all our questions on file cards because I know how much you love them. Yes. <laughs> order, more order. Right. Okay. So since we're here in the library, I'd like to start with a question about books because you write a chapter in, called Bookworm in Role Models. In Crackpot, you gushed about the writing of Ann Tyler, Jean Reese and Grace Metallius. In Role Models, you made me want to read We Need to Talk About Kevin, The Man Who Loved Children, and every volume of Ivy Compton Burnett. Yes. How do you discover these books, and what makes a good book for you? Is it the writing, the use of the language, the storytelling, the narrative? Well, I and I hear about the books. I mean, I read reviews all the time and everything, but also when I worked in the Provincetown bookshop when I was young, you need a a, a filth elder that tells you about good books. <laughs> and certainly, E. Lloyd Hansen at the Provincetown Bookshop told me about um, 
uh, uh, the, what's her name? I'm just going, Jane Bowles, Two Serious Women, which is a really famous great book. He told me about that one. Um, Ivy Compton Burnett, someone, I think Michael Cunningham mentioned her to me. Um, and her books, I mean, I'm recommending books that are not easy. I mean, I once said on the Baltimore Sun that somebody asked me to pick a book for something, and I picked those as my favorite book, and the Borders guy told me that they ordered ten, they sold them on every single person, brought them back. <laughs> Now, how many people bring books back? That's pretty rare. And, and she is tough to read. But once you read her, what, what I like about books is their extreme style and their confidence and, and that it, they're hard to read. I like hard books to read. I don't understand why people said they escape in a book. I want to escape into a book, not from my life. And why do people hate, feel bad books? I love them. I feel good anyway. I don't expect a book to make me feel good. They're not, I'm just not like going to the priest to read a book. Um, uh, and, and so I like books that, that Mary Vivian Pierce says in um, Female Trouble, she says, just think of all the little horror stories that go on in other people's lives. Well, everybody does have some horror stories, and they're kind of interesting to experience. So I always thought, like... Christina Stead's book, The Man Who Loved Children, which is probably the most horrifying, depressing um, look at a heterosexual marriage. Um, and, and I think we're, I want to form a hate book club, you know, <laughs> where everybody comes up and we reenact her terrible marriage. And it would be fun to do that, you know. So I'm for book clubs that spread misery, basically. <laughs> Well, you said you've yearned for a bad influence as a teen, and you boy, did you find one in Tennessee Williams. I did. Um, but I was, now, I was even under a teen, I think, when I first read him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you gush about... He was, too. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Trying to keep composure here. Um, I mean, you, you wrote about stealing one arm from the library, which, yeah. you know, because we're in a library, we wouldn't necessarily recommend people do. But it was on the C Library. Well, yeah, when I was young, I would, they had a card catalog then, I'm certainly showing my age, and I would look up books I wanted, and it would say C Librarian. <laughs> and, and then, the li which today I think it's a problem, librarians cannot give children some books, which is wrong, because I think if I had heard of Baby Doll, I should be allowed to read it. The same way if a kid comes in today, he's eight years old, and says, I'd like to get a Dennis Cooper book. Well, if they're old enough to know who he is, give the kid the book, really. Uh, so I did steal it, and, um, but I have given money to the library since, so my karma <laughs> is all right. But... But, um, and that book is so beautiful, and I guess in the Tennessee Williams estate, it didn't bother them that I stole the book, because later I wrote the introduction to uh, memoirs when it came out, and, and that led to me writing role models, really. And also, they recently put out a little book. What's it called, you tell me? Tales of Desire. Which are all the really sexy, longing, weird little books that were C librarian books that Tennessee Williams wrote, all the stories in one little beautiful little uh, volume. New Directions publisher. Yep. Um, now, did this story, One Arm, which, you know, I, I had the pleasure of reading last week, um, it's about a one-arm stud sentenced to the electric chair. And I'm wondering if the true crime aspect of it, it made you sympathetic to the misunderstood or inspire you to write about criminals. Well, you know, I hadn't read that story since then. I didn't even re read it again when I wrote um, Role Models. But I read it again in this little book, and I thought, oh, my God, there's a flashback stuff I had forgotten. There's a little drawing of the electric chair with a tack in the seat <laughs> that, that he imagined from his cell. And uh, I, I thought it was so great. You know, it just gave me flashbacks to when you're a kid and you first feel perversity throbbing in your childhood veins and how exciting that is. But you are the only one that knows. And then you don't know there is another person like that. They, you don't know there's bohemia. You don't know there are beatniks. You don't know there's... And then you read a book and you think, oh, my God, there's another life. Everything they're telling me in school, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do I don't want to do that. So I never felt left out, really. I mean, I'm not saying I never had trouble in school, but most of the people that would beat me up never did because they knew I hated authority even more than they did. <laughs> and they thought I was nuts, which is a good protection in when you're young and weak. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I got through school all right, and I used to just watch the bad girls. They were Some of them performed for me. I was a juvenile delinquent voyeur, basically. <laughs> I didn't know them, but they would do stuff and then look over at me. 
Just like I <laughs> directed people in movies. It was the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask what you were like as a teen, because I can't imagine. I mean, you know, you well, before to... LSD or after? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on when you started taking it. <laughs> Early. Um, I, I, my mother always says, don't tell young people that. Um, I, I mean, I had friends that I took LSD with that are dead now that became drug addicts. Um, I took it in 1964 when we stole it again from um, <laughs> Shepherd Pratt Hospital, where they used Sandoz acid as, tr as treatment for alcoholism. <laughs> I guess that, that experiment didn't last. I, I, I haven't seen too many AA meetings tripping, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I'm going to change the topic. Let's <laughs> let's let's discuss Leslie Van Houten because well, that's, you have a, you I'm afraid it has some LSD in that story too, in a very sad way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, I led to that. You have a very strong bond with her, and I'm I'm sort of curious because you've spoken out a lot about her um, her case, how you got her to trust you and um, not make you think you'd exploit her. Well, because in the very beginning, I, Leslie Van Helton is one of the three original so-called Manson girls. She's 60 years old today. She committed a terrible crime when she was 17 years old. She helped participate in the murder of Mrs. LaBianca for no possible reason except insanity and being under the control of the most famous madmen in probably any of our times, no matter how young or old we are. Um, you know, she should have gone to jail. She thinks that. She looks back on it with interminable grief, uh, horror. She says as she gets older, it gets worse and worse to deal with. But she has been in jail for 40 years. It's not nothing. And, um, if, and it's an insane case. It's, not, it's like no other case. Your kid could have met Charlie Manson and ended up there. Believe me, cults are all the same. And it took them three years when they built them a special death row, which she was originally sentenced to, for the women workers in the prison to, to begin to talk to them and say, can't you see? And, and she said her mind was breaking down like a machine that would get stuck. And she was trained to say stuff. And then she would start and realize. And then, you know, after years of therapy, she realized what a terrible, terrible thing had happened. And so I I'm, I, I'm never saying the, the victims have every right to say, and in the, book, in the chapter in the book, which is a long chapter, I, um, I went through every parole hearing and picked up the most devastating things they said against her release and also included them because I think I have to do that to be fair. And there never can be wrong. I would, I would never respond to anything they said, and uh, that was their family. Um, but Leslie did participate. She did not get life without parole. She got death originally, and it was overturned. And then the second trial was a hung jury with um, eight, to tw eight to five, I think, against for diminished capacity. She can't use that either, the same way they can't say, well, you originally got the death penalty, because that was overturned. In her third trial, she was convicted. And she got life, life not without parole. I believe in rehabilitation. I taught in prison. If you don't, I understand why you think she should never get out. Um, but she participated in a system within the prison that for 40 years they told her, you can earn parole. There is a system. And she has done that. Nobody thinks she's a danger. Everyone knows she is better. Uh, but it's just the horror of the case. And a, and a judge overruled recently, you can't keep telling her to do stuff when she does everything for 40 years, but then say the horribleness, the, you know, the terrible crime. She can't change that. That's the only thing she can't change. So as she said, I'm not trying to get away with anything. I take responsibility for everything that happened in that house that horrible night. It's a, t it's a terrible case, and there's no fair answer, and that's why I will always be very interested in it. I think she trusted me because I visited. I originally went, wanted to interview her for Rolling Stone. She said, I don't want to be in a magazine for what I did. I'm embarrassed by what I did. So um, it, it took me 25. Then I just stopped writing about it. I just visited her for 25 years, and we became friends. Very good friends, actually. And I've met her support group. I've met her family. And one of her friends that has visited her since she went to high school with her and has visited her constantly since then. And, uh, and finally, when I was going to write this book, I said, can I do it if I, I want to write about your re rehabilitation? And she said, yeah, I, I do trust you. You know, I think I, in the very beginning, she said, I, I like you because you don't make me feel like a freak. You know, she was really, I mean, how would you feel? You know, she's in Madame Trousseau's Wax Museum, you know. I mean, it's a tough thing to overcome, yeah. Well, yeah, and I want to talk about that, because you write that she's an unwilling star in the book. Um, that well, when people ask for her autograph, I've seen her in the visiting room, and she's humiliated by that, and, and, you know, appalled by that, actually. 
Yeah, as well she should be. I mean, you, you, you talk in, in Crackpot about how to become famous, and you have these like lessons. But in Role Models, you write about fame in a different way. Johnny Mathis, you say, is beyond fame. Yeah, uh, he is. He's a, he, I, I wish I were Johnny Mathis. <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> you want to sing? You can sing. No, 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 I can't. But uh, not as beautifully as he can. But, but Everyone would just start making out. <laughs> Mass making out. That's an amazing thing that happens whenever he sings. But fame is something that others project on you. I mean, you, I mean, unless you're, I guess, you know, narcissistic or, you know, egomaniac. I mean, you sort of are a legend in your own mind. But, but your thoughts about fame are that famous people attract us and fascinate us. And, and what makes us idolize others? I mean, I think that's what you're getting at here. Well, to me, what makes people want to be famous, I mean, anyone that goes into show business like myself is basically a very insecure person that wants, for the rest of their life, depends on people I don't know that are sitting out here telling me if I'm good or not. Mm -hmm. And that's trying to make up for what love you didn't get from your parents before you were three years old. It's quite simple. <laughs> I guess, I mean, and you'll never get it. And you'll never get it. <laughs> and once you do, you can be a healthy neurotic like I am. But I guess with, with the fame thing, I mean, because you idolize people. I mean, you've written a whole book on all the people you idolize. Well, idolize, I don't know if this is the right word. I'm incredibly moved by their life experience, the extremeness of what they've had to go through, either good or bad, or, or being like Bobby Boris Pickett, someone that had one hit, the Monster Mash, that he sang for 40 years. I'm, I'm jealous of him. Every day I have to think up something new for my career. He just had to think of that one damn song over and over and over. And I do the Monster Mash still. And it's, I'm telling you, try it with Kleenex boxes on your feet because that makes it even better. You know, Howard Hughes always did that, wore industrial Kleenex boxes. And I've done it. It really puts you in a good mood. So just put them on and do the Monster Mash and throw those mood elevators away. You don't need them. Okay, so let me ask how you started developing or shaping your taste in music and books and film. I mean, what is your criteria for what you like? Um, I mean, why did you gravitate to Johnny Mathis then instead of like Ricky Nelson? Or why do you? Well, like I like Ricky Nelson too. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, Johnny Mathis because he was the opposite of me. I mean, Johnny Mathis has mass popularity. He gives no interviews. He doesn't have to support his fame, which is amazing. Everybody has to go on the road today when you have any new product out. He never does. I've been to his shows. There's no pre-publicity. They're sold out. Um, they don't even announce him on stage. He just the band's up there, and all of a sudden you see, oh, he's up there. He just moseys up, you know. And so I went to his house, and, and it was hard to get him to invite me over. I didn't know him. And um, you, Did you, know, he know you and his lawyer called. And, you know, I said, oh, you Googled me. That's trouble when that happens, you know. <laughs> if they're suspicious and they Google me, oh, great, you know, when they look at my career. Um, but he was lovely, and I went to his house, and it was a beautiful house with a beautiful picture of him, a famous picture dressed in white that's on the cover of the first album, the oil paintings in his living room. He was lovely, really kind and nice. And I knew he was a Republican. I had heard that. And um, <laughs> I'm open-minded. You know, I, I hate liberals that never think someone else might not agree with them, which is like all liberals, <laughs> including me. Uh, but... And then I thought, well, I heard that Nancy Reagan comes over and sings Christmas carols with him. And I thought, well, Patricia Hearst came to my house and we plotted hair color for a trial testimony. So isn't that the same? <laughs> it's just the other side. It's the same everywhere. I mean, now they hate Obama as much as we hated Bush. It's the same. It's just switched 50-50 the other way. <laughs> And so um, I, I thought, well, he might be the opposite of me, but would he understand my house if he walked around? And I have brass knuckles by my bed. I have, like, <laughs> book Roughneck Rimmer sitting there. Would he, you know, that might be trouble for him, too. So, you know, anybody's house, if you snoop around, you're going to see things that maybe are. He was a lovely, kind man, and I love to hear him sing. And now when I do radio shows all the time, they play his music when I come <laughs> on, which makes me crazy. I love it. And I think we should just, we both have Christmas shows, and so I think we should just switch. Uh -huh. And I'll come out and sing Chances Are, and he'll come out and talk about Chubby Chasers and Santa Claus, and watch both of our audiences freak out and demand their money back. Yeah. 
Well, what about, I mean, you also talked about Little Richard, and, and you know, I mean, you, I, I know you prefer him over the Beatles, who you once completed. No, I like the Chipmunks better than the Beatles, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the Three Stooges better than Chaplin. That really makes people crazy, but I do, you know. I'm amazed by the, by the Mo Howard, who looked exactly like the Shoe Bomber. And I think about the Shoe Bomber a lot. Suppose you were sitting on a plane and you saw Mo Howard get on, sitting next to you with shoes with fuses sticking out of them. Got a light? Whoa. <laughs> Flight attendant. You know, I mean, it's, it's a fashion choice. <laughs> That's, you, you, you must have known my question. So the, the, I was going to ask about your fashion choice. You, well, but I think shoes with, but, with fuses out of them that are kind of glamorous, really, if they're, you know. <laughs> Well, you write that your look makes speed freaks nervous. Well, it, it, when I was younger, it made speed freaks nervous because I used to wear shirts with tarantulas on them and like pimp outfits, right? Uh, I don't anymore, as you can see. Well, this is sort of pimpish, actually, when I look at it. Yeah. It is. Yes, it's a very nice jacket, though, and like socks and the shoes. Um, but why does something like, you know, Ray Kawakubo's, you know, Combe de Sarn line appeal to you, but pleated pants completely turn you off. You know, I was raised to wear preppy clothes, so the sight of khakis, I gag. <laughs> but um, I, when I come to Garcelle, I love her clothes because they're expensive and something's the matter with them. <laughs> so it used to be in Filene's basement, they say this is called, you know, it's cheaper because it's broken, but right. this way you pay with double the money. So I like wearing fashion where it's not bragging. Most people think you have on rags that were rejected from a thrift shop, but it cost a thousand dollars. So I love that. It's like, it's, it's wearing clothes in reverse. It's wearing, you're pay, spending money for clothes that look worthless on purpose. And to me, that's witty, that's that becomes art then to me. And I think Ray Kawakubo is, is a brilliant artist, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you modeled for her. You talked I about I did, that. which was really embarrassing. They asked me to model in Paris. I mean the couture show and by the Louvre. We're talking the real thing, right? So I went, and, um, and I thought, I have to walk down. And I was the first one to go out with the venom-dripped fashion press waiting, right? And I felt like Don Knotts meets mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> but... I did it. Well, you're very approachable as a celebrity, and um, I would say your experience with, with Little Richard, someone you admire, did not go as well as... as well, Little you Richard, spoke. you know, I went to interview him for Playboy, and I love Little Richard. You know, I stole his mustache. Um, I, you know, he scared my grandmother when I was young when I first put on Lucille in her apartment. All the antiques started rattling, you know, and they called him flamboyant. We know what that means. And so, um, <laughs> code word. And... Uh, if you imagine seeing what he was like in the 50s, when you see him, The Girl Can't Help It, which was really became Divine Song that we kind of appropriated, he was unbelievably great and frightening and made all white people so nervous, you know, which I'm always for. And uh, so... But so when I went to visit him, um, he had just written this biography that is amazing, this biography of Little Richard, that tells about when he used to be a drag queen, when he used to mail people bowel movements. I said, we did that too! I didn't know it was a trend. <laughs> and, but then he got uptight when I would ask him that. And I said, well, it's in your book. I'm here for Playboy. What do you think I'm going to ask about? And, uh, but he also had a religious audience, you know, and he didn't yes. want them to know that. So it was confusing. But I love Little Richard. It didn't go very well, the interview, but it was funny. And at the end, he said, okay, you have to sign a paper that said, I approve everything you wrote. And I said, well, I can't do that. And then this bodyguard eyed me, but I could have beaten up this bodyguard. <laughs> So it, it didn't end so well, but I hope Little Richard and I meet again. I'm, I'd like to start over with him. Okay, what, what, how do you think people should handle meeting their role models? I mean, you know, if you're disappointed being on the receiving end of, of talking to someone, I mean... I think you don't have to meet your role models. Certainly, you um, I didn't meet many of the role models in the book because they're dead. But, um, <laughs> but no, that matters. Um, <laughs> I'm a cult, I'm not a cult, I'm not a cult leader. I'm a cult folk director. I can't raise them from the dead. Um, <laughs> But still, I don't know, I think you can, when you meet, you don't have to meet them. Certainly a lot of the artists that I really like, you don't have to meet artists that you love to, if you hang it on your wall. You don't have to know them. Um, I think it's sometimes after I meet, I'm, the role models I write about, it's not one thing they did, it's their entire life, really, that has impressed me, that when I finally want to meet them, because... Um, because I just want to see what they're like in real life. And I was never disappointed, except a little with Little Richard. But I wasn't that disappointed, because Little Richard lives in an alternative universe. <laughs>
Okay. Well, you describe good and bad mothers in the book, your Baltimore Heroes chapter. Um, you said your mom used to drop you off at Bohemian Bars, which shows her tolerance with you. Yeah. And in contrast, you have Zorro and Esther, who are women who lived pretty hard lives. Um, Zorro was a butch stripper who comes out on stage naked and says, what the fuck are you looking at? Yeah, and she, she looked like Johnny Cash <laughs> with great tips. Yeah. It's a tough look. <laughs> and Esther was a bartender who ran a joint for alcoholics, mental patients, and vets with an iron fist. Yeah, Esther ran the Club Charles in Baltimore, and she had the filthiest mouth of any woman. I've, and I loved her. Every word was that, motherfucking God. And her last words were, move your coat, asshole. That's what her kids <laughs> told me. Which I love. Such a legacy. But both these, and Le Zorro, the lesbian stripper, had a daughter that grew up. The most harrowing story, she tells me about it. Like, when she was eight years old, she made $1,000 a night working at her mother's poker parties where everybody was on bennies. She used to drive her mother's Lincoln Continental when she was 11 years old to pick her up at the bar where she was kicking the shit out of men and women. <laughs> and, uh, and Zorro, right up to the end, was terrible. But yet, she produced a daughter that led a double life. She went to Catholic school. She was the president of the class. And nobody knew what was at home. And I find this fascinating. These kids turned out fine from both families. And all that matters is if you know your mother loves you. These, the, the authorities would have taken away these kids from the families if they knew what was going on then. And, and I'm not saying that they were good. They were terrible mothers, which I've always said lesbians have the right to be bad mothers as much as straight people do. <laughs> That's some new thing to fight for, but uh, it's true. And um, so, so to see these kids that turned out well when they grew up in the most harrowing nightmare relations with parents is kind of, I think, very appealing to me. And, and I know people that had parents that seemingly looked like the most normal kind parents, and the kids are insane. So you can't order up your parents. You can't order up your kids. And you have to realize that on both sides to grow old together without killing each other, basically. Uh, you have to learn to... You know how to push your parents' buttons, and they know how to push yours. So you just think before you speak, and it's a truce. And I tell people, if parents or kids won't do that, bring a verbal abuse whistle with you to family <laughs> events. And when it happens, just really loud blow the whistle, and they get the point. I will not try that. Yeah. But speaking, of, speaking of mothers, my mother's in the audience. Oh, so good. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I had gonna, dinner with her. She's a lovely woman. Yes, lovely I'm going to skip the outsider porn chapter. We're not going to do the My mother isn't allowed to read the book for the outside porn chapter either. <laughs> so let's go into how you got started collecting art, because your taste ranged from class to trash, photography, sculpture, prints, canvases, abstract and minimalist, from Richard Tuttle to Cy Toomley. Your art enrages folks, but it makes you happy. Isn't that the point of art? It is. You know, when I was about eight years old, I went to the Baltimore Museum and bought a little print, like Miro print, and I put it in my bedroom, and all the eight-year-olds were going, that's disgusting. Wow, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I thought, oh, the power of contemporary art. And um, I, I still love contemporary art that pisses people off, basically. It should. That's their job. It, it does hate you. And um, I know people that have contempt for contemporary art say, oh, my kid could have done that. I thought, well, they should have, stupid. It just sold for a million bucks. <laughs> Who's the dumb one? But people refuse to see it, and you have to see it in a different way. It's, I, I hate art for the people. What a terrible idea that is. You know, I'm for the, all the elitism of the art world. I like the impenetrable writing. I love it. We think, huh, what could that possibly mean? This is ridiculous. I love that. I love it. <laughs> Because you have to learn how to see. You have to learn how to read. You have to completely rethink everything. And then everything looks like art. And you're in on the magic trick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you're, I mean, you could say your films do that because you... you well, I don't know about that. Well, no, but... <laughs> But you challenge the status quo, you challenge the taste, you challenge the way people see things or perceive things or, or how they absorb them. Um, that, that you have to digest, I guess is the wrong word, but pink flamingos. And I, well, that I, one. I ingested yeah. it. Yeah. That one, you know, that movie will never, ever, you know, it's certainly not my best movie. It's one that will always be there. It didn't get nicer. Uh, <laughs> Twenty-year-olds react the same way as they did 40 years ago, and now it shows on Sundance. How could that be true? that you can flick around with your family and see a singing anus in your living room. <laughs> it's amazing to me. What do you say to your kids? <laughs> a papa ooh, mal, mal. But... <laughs> 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 
That was the trash man singing. Right. Just talk about the music, I guess. Right. <laughs> you, de- you declare filth is just the beginning on the battle. What, what, what? You declare filth is just the beginning battle in the war on taste. Is deliberate bad behavior good, or should we all be quiet subversives? Well, I think bad taste is kind of over with now because everyone does it. It's what we export. It's like it's people try too hard with bad mm-hmm. taste now. To me, um, it's a sneak attack. Is where you question taste and and you use wit to to horrify people or or you know I, I think good humor can almost be terrorism. You know, I think we should humiliate our enemy. I, I want to get impetigo and spread it to our enemies. <laughs> Germ warfare. That's comic. It's low class. It's easy to spread. Just touch people we don't like. (laughs) Then they have scabs. (laughs) (laughs) It's time for that. (laughs) The people you write about all created a strong image, have created a very particular identity. And you've used, you write that the ultimate level of celebrity is to convince the press and the people that they know all about your personal life without revealing anything. Well, aren't you embarrassed when you read somebody in the paper that tells the most personal things about their sex life? Don't you have friends? <laughs> and they don't have friends. It's the same people, why, you think, why do they have telemarketers to call? Who would ever say yes? The one in 1,000 person that never gets a phone call and they're lonely. <laughs> And that's who buys it. That really is how it works. Huh. So it's the same thing. Um, if you if you finally, if they don't have any friends. So you have to say, oh, God, guess what happened to me last night? You shouldn't tell People Magazine that. You should tell <laughs> maybe a shrink that or, you know, your, your friends. But confiding in the press too much is embarrassing. You have to, you have to tell some stuff. And I think I've told plenty. <laughs> but I don't name names. Well, how do you maintain your identity when people want to emulate you? I mean, it's like, do you reinvent yourself? Or? What do you mean, emulate me? I, when they, I say whenever I have look-alike John Waters contest at college, just lesbians always win. So I don't... <laughs> I'm flattered, I think. Because the new lesbians look like the kind of men I like. It's so confusing. <laughs> well, my last question before we open up to the audience is that your book makes me want to read and meet and do all the things that you write about. And Crackpot did the same thing. How would you encourage others to follow your example? I don't expect anyone to follow my example, really. But I I would say that that believe what you want to do, you can do it. You know, I I hate people that say to me, they're not going to come knock on your door and say, would you like to be a filmmaker? Would you like to be a writer? But you can, you have to go out and claw your way to get what you want. But you have to not be afraid of rejection if you're in any kind of the arts. Because just think, a no is free. Every time you ask for something, I can see being afraid of of a no if it costs money. Mm -hmm. But it really doesn't. All you have is a little bit of less humility afterwards. But but still, it's it's important to just keep asking and fighting your way there and doing it. You can do it, but someone else has to like it. And I never understand when kids say, I hate rich people. Why? Who's going to pay for your movies? Poor people? (laughs) That, as far as I know, doesn't happen too much. You better learn to like rich people. You got one rich relative? Be nice to them. It's common sense. (laughs) I am sure there are lots of questions. Um, so we'll open up to the audience. We have two people with microphones on the side. So if you raise your it's hand, always we hard can... to get it started here. No. Oh, here's one. Yes. Hey, don't. My name's Dave. Uh, I just want to know what you think of Tommy Wiseau in the room and all that. What? Who? Tommy Wiseau. The room. He, he directed the film The Room. It's a cult movie that's like the worst. Oh no, movie. I haven't I haven't seen it yet, and oh. I'm I know yeah, that I'm you gotta re- see it. I know every person said it. It's the new one and it's a midnight movie that's working, right? I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. No, I know. It. I'm showing my age. I haven't seen that movie. What? I know. And the centipede one I haven't yeah, seen either. Centipede, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, we just saw it last week at, at midnight. So yeah. Was it crowded? Uh, it wasn't that crowded and honestly it was a little uh, it was a little weak. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And you still which one? The fr- uh, first sequence. Okay, okay. So I haven't seen it, but I certainly will, and I've heard about it. But I didn't know the director's name. What about Troll 2? Have you seen Best No, I haven't seen Troll 2 because I think I saw the movie for real. (laughs) And um, I I like those movies. You know, I like Chud best, if you remember that. Chud. 
cannibalistic, and Ch Bud the Chud was the sequel. That might be pretty close to one of the worst, too. Thanks. Any question over here? Um, I had seen you in one of your old interviews, actually. I YouTubed you. <laughs> YouTube, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you were discussing how um, in every town that you go to or city, you go to a weird tourist spot. Like in Atlanta, you went to see where Margaret Mitchell was hit by a car. <laughs> well, she was killed by a cab, actually, yes. Uh, I used to do that. That was from a piece I wrote in Crackpot called uh, the John Waters Tour of L.A., I think, where I went to different horror places that happened. Um, yes, I, I'm still interested to cross by, like in Philadelphia. You know, there's always a little, I'm curious about where Uncle Ed's apartment was, you know. And uh, I, I write about Uncle Ed in my book, poor thing, you know. My favorite thing was one of the boys said, look, if selling underwear and dirty T-shirts was a crime, Macy'd be out of business. <laughs> Anyone here know Uncle Ed? Not oh. Personally. <laughs> no one has any first-hand experience. Beer money, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a hand over here. Did you get the mic? Sound good. Uh... <laughs> yeah. It's Ethel Merman. <laughs> <laughs> Sing it out. I'm glad you're laughing. Yeah. I actually wanted to ask you about some unintentional shock that ended up on the commentary track for, I think it's Cecil B. Demented. Okay. You talk about, uh, this was a number of years before 9 11 happened. You referred to Forrest Gump as the World Trade Center of movies. Nobody could hurt it. <laughs> Nobody could hurt it. I said that. Oh, yeah, God. Yeah. Well, like, talk about words that you can't live down, right? Yeah. See, that's the only thing I never listen to is my own commentary. But um, they did try to bomb it the first time, you know, the, and it half worked. And, uh, and, and in the same commentary, you talk about how great it is that there were uh, one poster for Osama bin Laden. Well, in Baltimore, in my local post office in, like, this little redneck neighborhood was a picture of, have you seen this man? And it was Osama in the full outfit. Oh, yeah. I saw him up to 7-Eleven. So ludicrous in that outfit. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Baltimore. It probably would be a good place to hide out, actually. Maybe he is there. Right? <laughs> you let gays in the military. Those lesbians will find him. Let me tell you. <laughs> you watch. Okay, we have a question over here. Of you this week because, uh, of course, Art Linkletter just passed away, oh. and uh, Diane was mentioned as a footnote. Yes, so. and you know it did say in the articles, which is the truth, that Diane Linkletter was not on LSD when she jumped out of the window. She there was, uh, she hadn't taken it for a year. There was none of it found in her blood, and both Art Linkletter and Nixon used it to conspire against Timothy Leary and the drug culture at the time. And that's on the Watergate tapes. Really. Thank you for that movie. Rest in anyway. peace, Diane Linkletter. Yes. Okay, we have one up in the back. Gentleman in the back there. Whoops. Oh. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us how uh, Patty Hearst and you got together and, and how she agreed to participate. She's doing great. In the I mean, work. I see her all the time. She's in a lot of my movies. I think she's a gifted comedian. Uh, she never signed an autograph until she was in my movies. Same way with Leslie. She said, I'm not signed. Who wants to be a famous victim, you know? Uh, Patricia Hearst, you know, was always telling the truth. Um, and even the SLA, I can see why they probably think she joined them, but they only knew her after they kidnapped her and they never saw her again once she was freed from them. How would they know what she's really like? Um, she was a 19-year-old girl that was home doing her homework. Imagine how terrifying that was to be dragged out of her apartment, really raped and kept there and locked in a closet and everything. So she did become completely brainwashed by them. But um, the fact she went to jail is insane. And um, she was telling the truth the whole time. And I actually think San Francisco owes her a big apology. And she'll never do what someone tells her again unless it's a... A director who chooses his words with care, I think. Uh, but she's doing well, and her daughter became a big model. Lydia Hurst is a big model, and she, she has a happy marriage. She's doing very nicely. Any question in the back? Yeah. 
Um, I understand you're a minister of the Universal Life Church. I am. Have you ever performed any marriages? I've done about 13 marriages, but I stopped doing it because people wanted me to write some witty ceremony. But uh, I I do it now. It's $7. Um, A a divorce is $30,000. And and I baptized Tracy Lords um, before that she had a real, complete, very serious church wedding. And I haven't done an exorcism yet, but... Hoping. I'm sure the time will come. Yeah. Okay, another question. Over here. Um, hi. hi. With the collapse or kind of falling of the art movie house and the single screen movie house, where do you feel that cult films really have a place in the world and where should they go next? Well, it's tough. I can't get a film made now. I, I don't know anybody that can make get a f- medium price, which used to be about $5 million independent film today. But certainly for your first films, it's the best time ever because at Sundance, that's what they're looking for, are movies that cost $500,000. Every studio in the world is looking for the next weird movie that come, comes along from a kid somewhere. And uh, ever since Blair Witch and certainly Paranormal Activity, that's what they're looking for, a movie that can cause a sensation. And that's going to start online, certainly, but nobody can figure out how to make money online with a movie. Um, even porno is going bottom up because of online. Larry Flint asked Obama for help, <laughs> which I love that he did that. And I think he should have gotten porno stamps. I'm for that, actually. <laughs> it's tough, but it's certainly going to be online is, is the way um, it's going to cause a sensation. But then how does it end up being a midnight movie? I mean, that's the thing. The midnight movies that you're talking about, the two you're talking about, they're doing okay. I don't think they're, they're causing a full sensation, though, are they? I mean, I, it seems to me, when is the last movie that caused a sensation like that is Paranormal Activity, which, you know, came out of nowhere and made a billion dollars and everybody saw it in one week. When I started, there wasn't DVD or video, so it was just movie theaters. So with Pink Flamingos, it took three years for it to open in America. We went to a city at a time. We nursed it one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, and it played ten years in Los Angeles at one theater. Those days are over. If, if it came out now, it would open in a landmark theater. God bless them. They've, they've kept me alive for many years. And it would um, play one Friday and, and open on a Friday and 15 theaters. And if it didn't do well, it'd be gone Monday. And that's the way it is now. If you like a movie, go see it the Friday night it opens. That's the only night that counts. Because they've decided after that Friday the whole gross of the whole film for the whole world. And they've decided by Monday how much money they're going to spend on everything. There's no time for word of mouth. They fear word of mouth now because Twitter and everything, everybody just says shit like one second <laughs> after, the, after the first showing when they're walking out of the theater. They can't fight that. They can't fight it. Yeah, I mean, films are being more talked about these days than they're seen. You know, and people seem to have an authority on whether a movie is good or bad based on what they read or what they've heard. But they no, they, they don't read. But are rather you than kidding? what they've seen. They, I mean, to me, look, Hollywood movies are doing hugely successful. They're doing better than ever. It's like the Depression. Hollywood movies are doing great. Independent movies, art films, are not doing well. Why? I don't know. Maybe either people got less um, adventuresome. I don't know. Um, when I go to art movies, there's nobody under 50 in the audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Another question? I'm not bringing up Bruno Dumont. Hi. Um, in this filthy world, you expressed interest in making a children's film. Yeah. And with directors like Robert Rodriguez having had success with their children's films, do you have any plans? For well, that? I tried to make Fruit Cake. That was my children's movie, and it's about a very, very functional family of meat thieves, which we have in Baltimore. They come knocking on the door and say, Meat man! Come down and say, I'll take a pound of ham and uh, some uh, ground beef. And then they bring it back, they shoplift it, and you pay half what's on the price. It's the thing they come down and meet, man. Everybody yells out the window, I'll be right down. Come on, I'll take a turkey. And this is really common, you know. And so this is about a nice family. Fruitcake's a little kid, and on Christmas Eve, they're placing all the orders for the neighborhood, and he gets caught, and he runs, and he escapes with a little black girl orphan who's run away from her bad white gay parents who force her to have gay Kwanzaa. And (laughs) they hook up and meet other squatter kids in a slush storm in Baltimore on Christmas Eve and steal the meat and bring it back to all their community. It's a lovely Christmas story. Yes. I, I hope there are some other people in this room who remember so many 
midnight showings of Pink Flamingos at TLA on South Street. Yeah, with Elizabeth Coffey, yeah. Who I dated. <laughs> She's doing fine. I saw her recently. The first person who had the sex change paid by welfare, I No, believe. they paid for a breast. She had to buy her own vagina. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Later to, be the socialism, right? later to be the national bohemia beer girl on many uh, prints. She was great. And, you know, she um, had a great husband for a long time. They broke up for a while. He supposedly ran off the go-go girls. I don't know, something. Had a baby. They broke up, brought the baby back, and Elizabeth, and he has raised the child who's doing great. And Elizabeth's doing lovely. I've seen her, and she's doing very ending. well. Um, it worked. I, I wonder if, if you get offers for, uh, for film roles for acting or even... Uh, for directing outside of your own uh, Well, I don't direct projects. movies I didn't write. I do get offers. And I am playing Jesus acting? in a movie soon. Um, <laughs> I take the roles I'm offered. Uh, Typecasting? I've been a pedophile priest. In both. I was in a Woody Allen movie. I was in... Uh, I had my show on Court TV till death do us part. Uh, so I'm always... Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I take some of the roles just for fun. You know, fame maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> In the back. Hi. Given the um, title of your book, Role Models, um, we tend to associate that with young people looking for role models, and also what your comments about authority. I wonder if you could speak a bit about the institution of high school. Well, the book is not just young role models. I didn't hear the beginning of your question, but it certainly is role models for any age. I don't think the age has much to do with it. I even write about St. Catherine of Siena, the insane saint who drank pus and offered it up to God. I mean, she was a bottom for God. Um, um, <laughs> he asked, what's for a bottom for God? They get it. His date is turning bright red. Um, um, high school. It gave me the rage to make pink flamingos. Um, I was, every interest I ever had was discouraged in school. I think it's very different now. I know that there are schools where I know there are art schools where kids can go where you're encouraged. Everything. It's completely different than when I went. When I went, it was a Catholic school, and um, they encouraged us to break the windows of um, Madeline Murray O'Hare's house. And Madeline Murray was the woman that took prayer out of the school. And I write about her a lot in this book. It turns out she was a monster, too. And she, had, she loved to be hated so much that she was killed by a man named Waters. But he was terrible, too. He, um, he, well, he pissed in his mother's face and set, his, set her wig on fire. It's a terrible thing. I wish I didn't know that. But that's, set her wig on fire on top of it? How do you set a wig on fire? What did she say? I mean, it, I needed some follow-up questions to that. But I talk about Madeline. She was so terrible, she couldn't shut up until he rang her neck, really. And she, loved, she was even obnoxious to the man that was going to murder her. So she loved to be hated. When she would come out and do appearances like that, at the end, she would come out on a broomstick. I love that. <laughs> and she had bumper stickers that said, prayer is begging. <laughs> <laughs> in the back, way back. Oh, I was thinking the last row. You had your hand up. Did you ever think that um, the term teabagging would become so <laughs> Well, <laughs> teabagging, you know, when I did that in the movie, um, and then Rachel Maddow recently on MSNBC showed the entire scene from Pecker and said, when Martha Plimpton said, no balls on foreheads, you could hear the crew. I couldn't believe she showed it. I said, this is teabagging. Now, now they've changed it. They call it teabaggers because I think they found out what it was. Um, I, to me, I'm glad it caught on. And I have in the book about there was a case I guess I should feel bad about where somebody called the police at a fraternity hazing where this boy was traumatized because people teabagged him because they had seen my movie. I, I don't know. It's things worse. It could have been worse. I bet. But he talked about how humiliated he was for the rest of his life because he had been teabagged. And I thought, well, every woman's been teabagged accidentally <laughs> if her husband climbs over in the morning to go to work. Thank you for that question. 
It was one I could You can't get have. pregnant at safe sex. It's a fine thing. It's a fleeting <laughs> moment. We've got a hand up over here, thankfully. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering um, what inspired you to make a musical, uh, Crybaby. Well, I loved rock and roll musicals when I was young, um, and I wanted to do a thing that was sort of a takeoff on, on 1950s juvenile delinquents thing, because that's the first thing I ever wanted to be, was a juvenile delinquent. You know, if they went around the class and people saying, uh, you know, an, well, not an astronaut, I want to be a fireman, a policeman, I just kept thinking, I want to be that, a juvenile delinquent. But... Um, so I made a movie kind of about that, like a, an Elvis movie. And certainly Elvis was when I first, you can't imagine what the first glimpse of Elvis was like in 1956, because no matter what you may read, the 50s were a horrible time when everybody had to be exactly like everybody else. And, um, and I remember in my class in grade school, every single person was for Eisenhower, but me. I didn't like Ike. <laughs> and I'm not even sure why, except it's just everybody else liked him. So um, it was a time where juvenile delinquents, they're calm today, stealing hubcaps. You, you would be glad if you get a call from the police, your kid, or stealing hubcaps today. Uh, so I just wanted to make a, a musical that kind of brought back my first memories of Elvis and how insane it was to be rock and roll. And I love movies where, for no apparent reason, people just break into song and start singing. I love that Bjork movie where she did that, you know, Dancer in the Dark. Um, <laughs> I like all musicals where they just break into unnaturally into song for no apparent reason. Well, hairspray. I mean, you yeah. Have a musical there. Well, that was a good idea. Fat girl fights for integration. That was a damn good idea. I'll tell you, I never thought it would turn into all the thing. I never thought it would buy me an apartment in San Francisco. But um, <laughs> it it was a good idea. And um, what was the thing? You, uh, Harvey Firestein's mother. Or Harvey Firestein's mom said to my mom, didn't we raise terrific sons? <laughs> There's a lot of backstory in that, right? I would imagine. <laughs> Question over here. I think one of the things people really love is the casting in your movies. Thank and you. I guess the question I'd want to ask is, do you think of the actor before you think of the part, or do you think of the part and then think of the actor to I go with I used to. It, uh, Pat Moran has cast all my movies locally. Carrie Barden's helped a lot in New York and L.A. And it, it started um, when I made them for my friends. Yes, I, I wrote the parts for those people. But it changed after I wrote the part of Mole McHenry in Desperate Living for Divine, and he couldn't do it. So then I realized never write a part for one person because I suppose they can't do it. So... Um, even for Johnny Depp, I wanted him first. But when I'm writing it now, I don't think of who's going to play it. Although I have a folder that I'm always reading magazines and ripping out possible people. Um, but, you know, they, the way they want you to make films now, it has to be somebody that was in a movie in the last two years that young people know that made a lot of money. I mean, if Katherine Hepburn came back from the grave, she couldn't get a job. <laughs> so I've changed. On the side. How you doing? <clears throat> so I just had a question. Um, I'm a. I like to think of myself as a filmmaker. I want to be one one day. And I just want to know, looking back, do you see yourself sitting here? Like, is this where you expected to be? years and years ago? You know, when I started, I don't think that I ever thought I'd be 64 yeah. years old, really. But I didn't think I wouldn't. <laughs> You know, I, I, I was ambitious. I, I always thought anything can happen, and I still do. Um, did I see myself sitting here? No, but I certainly knew people that I liked very much that were directors that I wanted to be, and so I hope to be sitting here one day. Um, I've always read books, so I'm really thrilled. This is my really my fifth book. It was my third real book that you have to write yourself. Um, <laughs> oh, the cult thing. Um, well, as I say in the book, I'm tired of being a cult film director. I want to be a cult leader. <laughs> and the last chapter is how I want my cult to be and what you have to do to join, which is quite complicated. Okay, over here on the side. Um, as you said, it's 
been a long time since Pink Flamingos. I was just wondering if it's hard to stay in bad taste. Hard to what? Stay in bad taste. You know, I don't know that this book has any bad taste in it, in a way. I mean, to, to porn chapter. The porn <laughs> chapters, not bad taste. I thought they were kind of touching. You know, they were, they were outsider pornographers. They, they, one specializes in straight Marines and the other one specializes in scary psycho convicts. They're saints, if you ask me. <laughs> saints of pornography. That, that risked their life and their, their complete lives so we could look at these pictures. Um, I, I think that I'm having a big art show of his David Hurl stuff uh, this Friday that opens in New York at the David, at the Marion Boski Gallery where I show. So um, I'm trying to bring them to a new audience. And um, they asked David, well, who was the last person you slept with? And he said, I don't know. He was in the park and he had, I hate the police tattooed on his chest. <laughs> we all have a type. And you know what Tennessee Williams said? My type has never heard of me. <laughs> it's a great line. <laughs> okay, we have time for two more questions. So we got one back here. Uh, everybody knows your devotion to uh, Baltimore. Just wondering if you have a favorite crab shack down there somewhere. Crabs, you know, I hate to tell you this. Besides I hate these. all that banging and sitting there with those stupid bibs on and newspaper. <laughs> I hate it. I like soft shell crabs where you eat the whole crunchy legs. I like them. It's too much trouble hollering out stuff and wearing those ridiculous outfits. No, I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. Uh, All right, go one more. In the back, you got your hand up. I don't want to. Hi. 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 <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed your cameo in Homicide. Thank you. And, uh, I was, <laughs> I was wondering um, if you ever had an opportunity to be on the wire, or how you felt about no, it. No, Pat won't put me in, and she's my casting agent, and she does the show. <laughs> um, I was in Homicide uh, a couple times. Um, no, I love The Wire, and I like Tremaine now. I'm watching it, too, the new one that takes place in New Orleans. Um, I think The Wire is the best show that's ever been on television since Pee Wee's Playhouse. Right. <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you very much. Be Thank signing. you all. Thank you for listening to a podcast from the Free Library's author event series. If you live in Philadelphia or are planning a visit and would like to attend an author event, information is available at freelibrary.org.